you, Erin, for the lovely introduction. Um, so, my name is Sophie. I'm a junior in the School of Foreign Service, also studying Science, Technology, and International Affairs. Um, and I had the good fortune to be part of both of the delegations to Nairobi and to Merida um, in May and September, respective, respect, respectively. Yes. Um, and yeah, just to echo what Erin has said, um, my biggest you know, motivation for being part of the Environmental Futures Initiative is really that um, when you learn about these kind of large scale issues in a classroom at Georgetown, uh, you know, we all take the Common Core and the SFS, it's really easy to get bogged down uh, by these kind of colossal problems that just seem so difficult to tackle on your own or even in, uh, in, a, in an environment as, as great as Georgetown's, it, it, it can seem overwhelming. Um, and what I have taken out of these two experiences is that uh, there really is something to be done, especially uh, in, in the terms of environmental policy. There is so much capacity for youth particularly to get involved in these kinds of issues and make a meaningful change on the ground change and in policy making. Um, and that's what the EFI is really about for me. It's, it's uh, kind of opening this conversation to allow students to engage in these kinds of opportunities uh, and to kind of have this realization and sit down and say, you know what, this is something that we can uh, tackle as, as a group of young people together. And academics and, and students alike. So that's kind of the broader takeaway from these two uh, trips that I had, uh, that I was lucky to take with Justin and, and another student called Mandy, who was not able to be here today. She's also um, she's a senior in the School of Foreign Service. So great group of people we've got here. Yeah, if I could briefly, by the way, interrupt. I just want to say in the bottom right hand corner, uh, that's a selfie uh, that uh, Mandy took. Uh, Justin, would you care to explain what's going on in that selfie? Sure, so um, that is the executive director of UNEF, the UN Environmental Program, um, Occam Steiner, uh, who is, the conference that we went to was sort of his brainchild two years ago. Um, he put it on, he kind of got all these leaders together to set UNEF's agenda um, for the next two years um, in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals and, and you know creating the UN's mission on different ways to implement different sustainable policies. Um, I'll touch on why I was talking to him uh, in a little bit, uh, but that was a super awesome moment that just shows sort of, I guess, the broader mission of the EFI, um, which is really connecting students to these sorts of opportunities. Um, I'll pause it for a sec. My name is Justin McCartney. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service studying culture and politics, not SPIA. Um, but yeah, so I joined the EFI sort of for this reason, to have the opportunity to go to places like Nairobi or to Medida, Mexico, um, and dialogue with international leaders like Occam Steiner. Um, because I felt, at least, that on Georgetown's campus, you see so much energy from students in a wide variety of fields. Um, I have only been here a little over a year, and I've already seen that in so many different ways. Um, and I think issues of the environment are absolutely no exception. Um, but what I saw, um, I guess, how the EFI could fit a need there um, would be for making that bridge between all of that student energy and optimism um, for taking action on the environment to the, I guess, policy level um, or the action level where things actually do happen. Um, because as students, it's great. We can lobby the university to take more sustainable practices to um, include green space, to, um, to compost in the dining hall, um, to make sure that new buildings are, green, are, are as green as possible, um, LEED certified and such. Um, but there's a whole other realm that until we step off of Georgetown's campus, um, or really any college campus, there's a limit. You know, we're not in the real world, we're not dialoguing with these members of the environmental community. Um, and that's sort of, in my opinion, one of the biggest missions of the EFI is to give students that opportunity before you step off of Georgetown's campus. Um, and Sophie and I and Mandy um, have had that opportunity so far, and that's something that we're incredibly excited about. Um, so some of the ways we've made that happen over the last five or six months or so, and how we're looking forward to making that happen over the next semester, um, is through, um, first of all, making students aware of these opportunities and increasing these opportunities. 
Um, so one way we're looking to do that is by starting a speaker series um, throughout the next two semesters actually, bringing environmental leaders um, such as potentially um, Executive Director Steiner, um, former presidents, um, high profile environmental leaders, um, and international politicians who are doing this work at these international conferences and in their own country to promote sustainable practices, to kind of have these hard conversations, to sit everyone down at the table, whether that's business leaders, um, indigenous peoples, um, private sector people, government people, um, to shape a sustainable future. Uh, because these issues, as we've learned from a lot of these conversations, are not simple. Um, it's not going to take one or two policies and then we've reversed climate change. There was new studies out today that we're even hitting points of no return as it is. Um, but that shouldn't decrease our optimism and our hope. Um, so one of the things we love to see come out of this speaker series throughout the next two semesters is students to get inspired um, and to get engaged with the AFI or however they feel motivated to uh, to start talking about these environmental issues in class, on campus, but also outside of the university as well. Um, so back to the picture real fast, just to wrap up. Um, one of our, I guess, targeted speakers at that point was the executive director of UNEP, Occam Steiner, um, who we had seen a couple times throughout the conference, throughout that week, um, bouncing around at kind of high-level speaking events. Um, and this is right outside of a reception. Um, I One of the... I think like the third day of the event. Um, and we kind of like cornered him and finally gotten to him and I actually had a printout of the invitation that we had drafted for him to come speak at Georgetown. Um, I like hand delivered that to him, got uh, the business card of his personal handler um, and I've been in contact with her. He actually has recently transitioned out of the position of executive director at UNEP, um, but we stayed in contact with his handler and, and seen you know, if there's a possibility to get him to come to campus. But, that's just sort of one like snapshot example of already some of the awesome you know kind of opportunities the EFI has opened us up to. Thank you very much. So uh, <clears throat> my name is Randall Amster. I'm director of the program on justice and peace, also known as JUPS in the college. Um, and well, I just want to echo the. Well, I teach courses on themes like environmental peace building. I work a lot around climate justice and food justice and things of that ilk. I just want to echo the comments of my colleagues and. I don't say colleagues lightly. I think it's important to note that in the EFI, part of our um, reason for being and, and the way that we manage our shared space and explore these options is as colleagues. Um, obviously, we have different chronologies and different levels of expertise and experience. But when it comes to thinking about global, existential, environmental issues, we're all invested together. And it's going to take all of our collective wisdom and effort to realistically move the needle in time on these issues. I mean, this isn't, you know, like you were saying, thresholds being crossed 400 parts per million. You know, there's an organization called 350.org, and we've gone 50 past where their target goal was a few years ago. So we have some really profound crises in our midst, and it really does take a collaborative effort. All of this has been remarkably egalitarian. The way that we've managed our process is hopefully a reflection of the substantive ways that we're looking to try to manage and confront these um, very impactful and um, generationally salient issues. So these opportunities to go to forums like this are really a fabulous way to do that, to get out of the bubble, so to speak, to be in the field together. I think it's fair to say that when we're in the field and we're working on these themes and we're exploring new terrain, we find out different ways of interacting with each other and then meeting the world collectively. Um, we're able to go into other dimensions than you can find in a classroom space where we're talking about things um, academically, pedagogically, scientifically, theoretically, but also interpersonally and optimistically and emotionally. There are other ways of processing these issues that I think are important. Sometimes it's the in-between spaces outside of the established workshops and forums that really are the indelible uh, experiences that linger after uh, the excursions. So you can see some of that reflected a little bit. Pictures of vacations never capture the best moments. I think we all know that, you know, because you're living the best moments. And you only take pictures when things come to a little quieter or structured point. Um, but this does give you a representation. That's us by the, uh, on the edge of the Rift Valley, uh, the day that we got to take an excursion out outside of the city a bit and be a little bit off the grid. Um, this is the kind of impressive walkway to the UN. Um, to the UNEP headquarters in Nairobi, and you can see other manifestations of that as well. And I did want to show one other slide from UNEP 
um, from, from UNEA, and then we can talk a little bit about the uh, CEC trip. These were two infographics that were posted on the UNEA2 site, and I thought they were an interesting bookend of the experience. On the one side, you see um, the sustainability goals, and it's very, you know, kind of colorful, and it's um, programmatic, and it's got this um, sort of policy level of, of discourse to it gives you kind of the big picture headings and here's the things we want to focus on for our sustainability agenda. On the other side you have a much more activist intervention, something that um, is meant to spark a different kind of conversation. And I thought that really for me at UNEA was the, um, was the interesting thing that it was a tent big enough to hold the policy and the activist sensibilities at the same time. It was really fascinating to see how well they wove together and intersected, sometimes how they didn't, and then it was incumbent upon people who were more active, uh, actively oriented to push the agenda into the more hallowed halls of discourse and debate. But seeing those two things happen together, I think, was very promising because ultimately for the kinds of transformations we're talking about, it will take work within and without the systems that um, perpetuate and define the discourse around these issues. So those are some of my impressions from, um, from that excursion, and it was a wonderful experience to be able to be there. So I'll, I'll talk uh, a, a little bit. It's, it's been interesting, even listening to, to, to everybody talk here, there's a, a way of reframing that I think that we need to do uh, with the university, and this is what for me has been one of the most exciting parts of the Environmental Futures Initiative, and that is to get away from the compartmentalization of your lives at Georgetown versus your lives outside of Georgetown, uh, and, and and figure out just as just as Randall was just talking about that that slide being able to integrate, uh, uh, you you had the the UNEP umbrella which would, which was able to integrate both activism and and the more policy theory uh, and, and science discussions that were there. Uh, we need to be able to integrate our lives, and so education we know works best when that happens. Uh, this, this, is, this is just science, and this is the research, that you learn best, that we learn best, we teach best, when we're able to have that kind of integration. Randall, I know, has done a lot of great work in his career about helping, of having students get outside of the classroom. Uh, and, and not just have to integrate that. So, uh, particularly in the School of Foreign Service, these study abroads are common, the, these trips abroad are common. How often, though, are we seeing internships over the summer and such? Uh, um, we might think about that, well, it's all kind of wrapped up in my college years, but are you getting credit for it? Or, or, and, and, or on the other hand, is what you're doing in the classroom directly bringing in what's going on in your outside life? And I think that the Environmental Futures Initiative it, so far has been this fantastic platform whereby it's not so much in, uh, uh, taking what we've learned in the class and applying it out there as realizing what we're doing out there is a part of what we're doing in the class and vice versa. And that generational aspect um, is another thing. So I was able to go uh, with, as you see there, Justin and Sophie to, to Merida. We were able to meet with uh, Administrator Gina McCarthy and, and her team of, of officials that were there uh, she's the administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, she and her team gave us a 30-minute one-on-one uh, -on -one session, which was pretty spectacular. There was the minister from Canada. We, we spoke. It was kind of fun. Uh, right at the end of our trip in the airport, we ran into a woman who heads up an NGO in Canada, and she talked about her 90 seconds of glory with the minister of Canada, where she was able to meet and talk with the, the minister of Canada for 90 seconds. and. And, and I was almost embarrassed to say that we had 30 minutes with the administrator of the EPA. Part of it being because we had youth, we, we were students, right? And there is this, the biggest trump card in environmental discourse is future generations, right? We're doing this for future generations. We want our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids to see, right, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and everything else that we see now. And, and this, this is the most popular sort of thing that gets talked about. But likewise, uh, administrators for government agencies, uh, these, these organizations, they are very interested in bringing uh, students in as partners, I, I think, to negotiate. There are some different reasons for that, but one of the reasons why is, is when you get to be uh, old, like, like myself, even if I, I don't look like it, right? Um, you, you, you start to realize, right, you've, you've been fighting for, for so many years on these, on these lines, but you have to have the next generation. And it is the next generation that we're fighting for. So we need to, to have that integration, not only that, but the passion, the excitement, the optimism, and the new ideas, the fresh ideas that come 
from, from that uh, is important. And that's one of the areas in which I've seen our interactions in the EFI with some of these other organizations on these trips. That's where I've seen a lot of the cash value has been uh, this integration, this intergenerational integration. And, and not just a passing of the torch, but a carrying of the torch together and figuring out how to do that. President DeJoya, I know, is very interested in Georgetown not being completely departmentalized from the rest of DC. Right? And you take, you know, if any of you have been uh, familiar with the work of the Center for Social Justice, for instance, right? And, and recognizing that we live here, we are part of the city, and they are part of us, and uh, that can be part of our educational experience as well. Um, President DeJoy is very good at bringing in leaders from the community at organizing events here at Georgetown. And so that's the only other thing I wanted to mention about uh, the Environmental Futures Initiative that maybe we can talk a little bit more about uh, the CEC there. We have, we have members of our team that are going out to these, to these various international summits, to these different things, right? But likewise, we're, as, as, as has already been said here, we're working to bring them here. It needs to go both ways. Georgetown needs to be a, one of the center, one of the forums for, for this kind of global engagement around major problem issues. Just like Nairobi, Kenya, just like Mary to Mexico, uh, and where these, these UN and regional intergovernmental organizations are meeting, serve as fora for that global conversation. Georgetown needs to not just go out and engage in those global conversations, we need to be hosting those global conversations here, particularly around the environment. Yeah, I think James is absolutely right. Um, that's one of our kind of big picture goals is to make Georgetown a hub um, for these sorts of really important conversations. Um, and that has kind of manifested itself in our work so far. Um, we were some of the only, I think the only um, US youth delegates to um, UNEA in Nairobi. We were the only youth delegates to the CEC in Mexico. Um, so it just shows how, you know, we are, you know, invested in Georgetown becoming this sort of, this hub, as James put it, for youth to engage with these sorts of issues. Um, but a lot of that, and it's something I've reflected on a lot with these experiences, is not just because Georgetown's in D.C. or not just because we've had, you know, we've had these, like, chance opportunities to meet really important people and get these opportunities. Um, it also has a lot to do with the youth involved, and not just us, but the youth at Georgetown, um, and really just something about youth energy in general. Um, so, in my experience of just general youth engagement, I found it to often be tokenizing um, in a lot of ways. When you hear youth engagement as you know some sort of professional world topic, it tends to be, oh, we're stepping up our social media game, and here's all new fancy website features to engage the youth, um, and then that's over, and they're done, and that's awesome. They're going back to business. Something that we found. Um, and that we've made sort of a point in our mission, in our engagement with these um, types of opportunities, is to make sure that youth engagement is something that youth are driving. Um, we found that particularly at the CEC, well first of all, um, the fact that we were at the CEC at all was because Sophie followed up on a connection she had made in UNEA, um, and obviously you can talk more on that, I just don't need to be too humble there, because honestly the entire reason we were there was because of Sophie following up with someone in the EFA's office um, and you know physically got us there to Mexico. Um, and while we were there as well, um, this is an example actually, um, but, but we went in with the idea that we're not gonna let this be them telling us how they're going to engage youth. And at the same time, not us telling them how they're going to engage youth, but actually giving them a platform, saying this is how we want to be engaged, this is how we're going to make it happen also. We, this here, I'll explain a bit. Um, as you see, it's in three different languages. It's Spanish, um, English, and then French, which were the three languages of the CEC, which was a meeting of um, ministers from Canada, the US, and Mexico. And these are signatures of all of the youth delegates there from all three countries, including Sophie and I. And what this was, was we kind of set out a framework for how we thought the CEC and each of the individual ministers in general could engage with youth and include a youth voice and youth action in their sustainability goals. Um, this was not supposed to happen. This was something that the youth came up with at the conference. We decided that it was necessary. We felt that it, you know, we didn't want to leave leave the conference, go back home and say, okay, that was great. 
um, you know, like I feel like we talked about cool ways to engage youth. We wanted to make sure it was going to happen. And this was one of the ways that we decided we wanted to see happen. Um, but at the same time, this wasn't just a proposal that we slipped into the hands of the administrators and then left. We have a Facebook group. We've been talking with, you know, our youth from Mexico and from Canada, and we plan on following up. You know, this isn't something that they're going to create and then sort of, you know, just pick and choose youth that they want. This is going to be a youth-driven project. And in our opinion, it kind of has to be if it's going to be true youth engagement. Because youth engagement should come from the youth, as I've said. Um, and this is just one example of that. And we, yeah, we've found that it's, if you're going to engage youth, that's the most important way to do it. Um, and that also is going to be our mission moving forward in a lot of our other opportunities, both with the CEC um, and just in general. Um, and I'll let, I guess, just hope if you want to touch more on that. Sure, just to explain a little bit more about what this is. Um, so the CEC is comprised of a council, which consists of the three ministers from the three countries. And then there's also something called the JPAC, which stands for the Joint Public Advisory Committee, um, which is a group of individuals who um, are also part of the CEC, to which we suggested um, the inclusion of a youth advisory committee. So um, our goal coming into this conference was, as Justin said, to create some kind of longitudinal youth engagement uh, within the policy making framework that exists um, in the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And so uh, what the document you saw in the slide before was um, a proposal that we drafted uh, as the youth members to this conference, um, suggesting just that, that there should be a, uh, a youth advisory committee to the JPAC. Um, which we then were able to get signed and kind of staged an intervention <laughs> in the final concluding remarks of the ministers where we presented it to them. Um, can I, can I just interrupt right there? Yeah, right? So structurally <laughs> for this conference, the youth engagement was a town hall where they were able to ask questions and actually that's what this picture right here is. At the end of this town hall where the ministers were all kind of giving their spiel, they allowed the youth from the different countries to pose questions. But rather than that be the involvement of the youth, as is being said here, right? The youth came up and said, said, no, actually, so up here on stage, this is when they presented each one of the ministers with a copy of, of this document. Rather than, rather than ask a question, it was, uh, no, let's be a part of you. Yeah, always be prepared, even when you're not. And so that was ki kind of an exceptional experience to be able to um, create something tangible uh, in collaboration with our youth counterparts and present it. Um, that was just a great feeling. Um, and so then in addition to this, uh, uh, there was also a, an action plan that was drafted in advance of the conference where um, we came up with a set of ideas um, for different approaches to how youth can be engaged in the CEC and more broadly uh, within the EPA's framework. Um, and so some of those ideas, uh, well all of the ideas kind of focus on a two-pronged approach. So the first part is that um, youth need to have a voice in policy making, which was kind of what the point of this whole thing was. And then the second part is that um, youth should be playing an active role in doing community outreach projects and doing on the ground work, which I think is what the EFI is a great example of um, in all of our individual and collective projects that we uh, undertake. But um, one of the in more interesting um, activities that we had proposed, proposed in this uh, action plan was the creation of a documentary, which um, should be, or we, we had um, you know, planned for it to be a collection of clips from youth ar around the, um, the, the North American continent, kind of showcasing how uh, youth are engaging with the environment and how um, youth are uh, you know, working within their own communities and um, more extensively to, to um, make meaningful change. So that's something that we're also working uh, on now, going forward from these experiences. I think it's worth um, considering that when it comes to environmental policy making and environmental governance at the international scale, it's not self-evident where the locus of power actually resides. There's no real standing entities that are doing environmental governance um, that offer straightforward ways of interacting with. So UNEA and CEC, CEC at the North American regional scale and UNEA at the global scale are two of the um, limited range of standing 
environmentally focused bodies where this kind of leverage can actually be accessed. And so for youth to be, you know, in some ways having to kind of push their way into the agenda and not just be there for window dressing and making it seem as if there's intergenerational justice being talked about, this is a fairly remarkable thing. It's easy to just see the pictures or hear the colloquial stories and miss the larger point that this is kind of an intervention about a whole generation that's most likely to be impacted by the worst effects of these issues, demanding a voice at the table in the only standing forums that really exist to register global or regional impact on these kinds of issues. So this is, you know, it scales up. I mean, we, um, and I think we realize that even as it still does come down to people, right? So that's always the paradox. Like we saw at UNEA, a lot of the diplomacy was shuttle diplomacy. It was people interacting as individuals, but the scaled up uh, collective footprint of that turns into the potential for policy changes that can have significant ramifications on these questions. I think that's a great point that Randall makes about the generational aspect. Uh, President Obama had this great quote, he said, um, we're the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation to be able to do something about it. Uh, and I just think that's, that's just really well put. I think he's a great guy. But uh, <laughs> um, Yeah, you know, I think that's really true. And something that I've noticed as well from um, interacting with youth, particularly at these conferences and also with my um, colleagues at the EFI, um, is that particularly with youth, there's this perception that um, in order to develop um, we, uh, or there's, a, there's this kind of um, perception that in order to develop, you can't, uh, you have to forego sustainability. And that if you, if you are to, um, you know, have an innovative and uh, advancing society, well then we can't really have um, a sustainable society as well, because to go forward, it, 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 we necessarily must expend resources, right? Um, and I think that that is something that we're working very, very hard to tackle, that, that misconception. That um, it is in fact possible to develop in a sustainable way and to have our society advance um, and become more productive and more fruitful while being conscious of these kinds of issues that um, kind of unite us all. Uh, so that's something that also found to be really pertinent in these experiences. And Georgetown is just a great platform, or a great, I think, area for this work. The, the first time that I can remember kind of um, beginning to think about these issues, I was teaching over in, at our, our, your sister school. Qatar, SFSQ, and COP18 happened there, which was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. They get together every year. So last year was in Paris where they worked out this great big global agreement, right? Well, three years before that in Doha, uh, they had their big their big conference center, and it, it was it was uh, kind of interesting the timing of it. Work, I was teaching an environmental ethics class there, and the way that the timing worked. Qatar developed uh, sort of lightning speed uh, as, as it is. You go over there, I mean, it's as modern of a city as, as there is. And so much of it's been built on, on phenomenal uh, petrochemical wealth over the last 60 years. Uh, a lot of that originally is oil, they've switched a lot to natural gas, but it's been 60 years of, of, of wealth and development that, that brought lightning speed development there to the country. And those students that I was working with at the time uh, the projections came out that they had about 60 more years of oil production, right? And so there, though, they were there. They were the students, right? They were right at the center of 60 years would have come before them. There were 60 years left of of this kind of an energy market and, and wealth potential. And, and then there, they we we had you know the conference of the parties uh, that were meeting to discuss climate change. And at the time, you know, we secured some. Uh, passes for them to go to observe some of the meetings and the interactions there and, and that's kind of right but it was very unsatisfying in the sense that right here's this generation that's right at the middle right right at the center and our engagement is that they can kind of be tourists and go to this big international conference and, and look and think about it uh, clearly there's a better way I think that this is this is one of the one of the big themes coming out of the Environmental Futures Initiative, and that is the better way is not to go as tourists, but to go and, and to partake in, in what's there in a very direct and substantive way. Perfect segue to talk a little bit about how we plan to continue to move forward to um, solidify the, the gains that we've made thus far, but also to keep on propelling ourselves forward to engage these issues in meaningful ways. So this is a little bit about 
the horizon of the EFI and the kinds of work that we're looking to do, not in an exclusionary way. We know there are many other groups doing wonderful work, and our aim is to help support and work with all of those groups, but also to carve out maybe this unique niche around um, direct engagement with environmental and international policy making. So this is a little snapshot. I don't know if, Aaron, you want to pick up any of this and talk about it, but there have been some other evolutions of the work that I think are fairly surprising for a, basically a six-month-old um, uh, ad hoc working group that is now <laughs> cohered in, in the impressive array of scholarship that you see before you today. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to pick up on some of the projects and things that we're, we're projecting forward. Sure, uh, and, and I think um, you know we'll we'll wrap up with further actions and outcomes. And I've got some questions for you all um, that if we have time, I'd love to ask. But I also would defer to any questions that you all might have. So I, if I don't get to ask any of mine, I would actually be quite happy. Um, I, I think starting from the top, uh, we are uh, delighted uh, and again really honored uh, to be able to partner with the uh, Undergraduate Journal for Global Citizenship which is a uh, journal out of Fairfield University, to create a special journal issue uh, dedicated to issues that were explored by the delegation that went to UNEA2, uh, and those issues that sort of, sort of uh, sprang from those conversations, and to submit that uh, for their consideration in the January, uh, December timeframe, or the December, January timeframe. Uh, and so I would just briefly pause to say that uh, a lot of the projects that we engage with start with small questions and desires. Oh, do you think that we might be able to send one person to UNEA to changes into, oh, do you think that we can send two people and a faculty member or three people and a faculty member? Or how, what can we do? What can we do with this and then try to make it bigger and better? Um, the original conversation that we had following UNEA 2 was, oh, wouldn't it be cool if all of us here uh, who contributed to this process uh, took some of the lessons that we derived from the experience of attending this wonderful set of environmental negotiations and then turned it into uh, a blog post, or turned it into an article, or turned it into a long-form research uh, 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 journal uh, issue. Um, I think that the fact that we ended up uh, being able to work with uh, a, a STEAM publication so that we could uh, just the EFI generate every single article that will appear within it is something that I couldn't have possibly expected or hoped for, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to participate in. Um, everybody here uh, is going to contribute to that process. Uh, moving on from there, I, I think that I want to highlight that we've been very lucky to be well supported by a number of organizations at Georgetown. Uh, the delegation to UNEA 2 was funded entirely by the School of Foreign Service, and to them we owe extraordinary gratitude. Uh, the delegation to the CEC Council session was likewise funded by the Office of the Provost and the Office of the Vice President for Global Engagement. Uh, to them, we are also extraordinarily grateful because it is not just the case that these organizations gave us money and said, take off, do whatever you will. They gave us money knowing that there was an expectation that we would use that money efficiently in order to A, make the trips actually happen, but to B, also take the knowledge, take the experiences and use them on behalf of, again, this Georgetown community that we're hoping to empower, as well as youth more generally in order to bring them into the fold and bring them into the conversation. And, and so for their trust, uh, for their uh, financial sponsorship and their co-sponsorship and their partnership, we are incredibly grateful. Um, I would also add actually a small uh, shout out to the uh, Lecture Fund, if I may, uh, for their support. Um, we're very lucky to be able to work with them, speaking of uh, on-campus partnerships and our speaker series. We're lucky to be able to work with them for this entire academic year on a number of speaking engagements that will kick off in October with our bringing the former president of the Republic of Kiribati, Anote Tong, to campus. Uh, later in November, we're going to host a climate panel, or rather a panel on uh, climate migration and displacement, the issue of uh, who is getting moved, when, where, and what are the legal, ethical, uh, and political implications of that. Uh, we'll be working on additional uh, speaking uh, events and other sorts of uh, engagements in the spring as well, but those are the ones immediately coming up. Uh, lastly, I, I think that and I don't know if any of you all want to comment on this uh, as, as a final note before we try and uh, engage with the people who are here today. I think that one of the greatest things that I've learned from you all uh, is that there is an extraordinarily, extraordinary latitude for developing right now the sorts of systems that we want to exist longitudinally. And I think that Sophie said this beautifully earlier, uh, we want those systems to be built deliberately. We want those systems to be built with intention. Uh, and not just intention, but intelligent, holistic intention. Uh, I think that it's vital that uh, as we move forward, we continue to employ these same sorts of 
precepts and the same sorts of desires that we have employed hitherto now. That is that we don't just want to have people be involved in the conversation superficially. We want people involved sincerely. And we don't just want to say from our position in the ivory tower what other indiv individuals and communities should and shouldn't do. We want to develop relationships with them and work with them to try and not only empower them as much as we can, but also try and find ways that we can have partnerships with real measurable outcomes. Um, I don't know, do any of you all want to, to comment on that or? Just, I guess one kind of wrap up. Um, going right off what Aaron said about these sort of tangible things that we've done so far that we hope to do in the future. Um, we say all of this not to brag, but to kind of show you the opportunities that we've had and that we love to share with the rest of campus and the broader, you know, youth community. Um, so we see this not as, you know, being the EFI doing all of these great things, but we see, you know, how can the EFI work with energy from students across campus? Um, think of all the things that we've been able to do individually and our ideas that have come to fruition. Um, but then think about all of the other passionate, energetic, amazingly intellectual students across campus that could contribute just as equally, even more so, in ways that we never could have imagined to the EFI. And then broadening that, what can we do if we can harness that sort of energy from students across the United States? Um, you know, bringing together students who are passionate about these issues and who have such amazing ideas into one sort of collective can produce incredible results as well. And then broadening from there, you know, these global networks um, of students and of these voices. So that I think just kind of sets up our vision: is, is we don't want, we don't show you all this to say, look at all we've done. Like, isn't this great? We say this because it's it's our mission going forward as well. We want to engage campus. We want to engage students across the United States and across the globe, um, because it is our generation that's going to feel the most effects, and the future generations beyond us. Um, and that's why we here have taken such a, a strong and passionate stance on why you know, important concrete action has to be taken now, um, but also why it's important to educate other people as well on why this is such an important issue, um, such a dangerous issue to our planet, um, but also all the possibilities that when we can bring people together, uh, we can actually, you know, accomplish. I think if we frame our role as one of service rather than one of elevation or some other version of something like that, I think it changes the way we approach these issues. That the idea is to utilize and leverage all the skills and capacities we have, and ultimately it's going to take that, all of our skills and capacities, if we're going to actually move the needle on these issues while there's still that window of time. Um, and in that spirit, I would like to just say, I think I can take the leap of speaking on behalf of my colleagues here. Um, those of us who are fortunate to go on these excursions owe a real debt of gratitude to Aaron and Sarah, who's not here this evening, who worked so tirelessly to organize, like to pull off trips like this with credentials and <laughs> risk assessments and logistics and finances, all of the work that went behind. And then neither of them was able to go on either trip, which is a fairly remarkable nod to the service ethic that I think defines this work, that you all worked so tirelessly to give us a chance to go. And of course, you know, you were there with us in spirit, but, um, but that's not something you often see, people willing to do that level of logistics and organizing to enable others to go and partake firsthand. And I just wanted to give a nod to you um, and Sarah for, for that work. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so I guess we probably do want to move toward, I just put a few little things, but these are clearly not meant to front load the conversation. We're really more interested, I think, in opening it up and hearing what you all have. Um, reporting back on these trips was part of the ethic that we took on when we went to do them, that we, we were requiring ourselves to come back and share with this community. And so we would like to um, say thank you for letting us do that and then open it up for any questions or comments you all have. Well, they great. Does anybody have anything that they're curious about, uh, either uh, to the group or uh, specifically? I guess I've, I've seen a lot um, of what you guys are planning to do and how to engage with the students at Georgetown and the greater community, but in terms of actual like, membership in the EFR, you can just expand the number of students that are likely to be in your organization, or is it more so the outreach? Question one, how can you get involved with the EFI? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, me, sorry. Um, <laughs> So I, I think first and foremost, uh, our goal is to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, as Randall was talking about earlier, the ethic of this organization is egalitarianism, uh, full stop. Uh, and so if you were to join, if you were to be interested in joining uh, in any capacity whatsoever, you would be considered a member of the organization. 
uh, and you would be considered an equal to the faculty members of the organization. That's something that, as Randall and James were talking about, is important to us. The idea that uh, we wouldn't necessarily be bound by hierarchy uh, and thus limit our possibilities, but rather we would be able to explore these issues and recognize the fact that you know the the amount of knowledge that we bring to the fore uh, is not necessarily going to. Uh, be comparable to what uh, Randall or James or Mark, uh, the director of SIA, who's also a member of the EFI, what any of them might bring to a particular conversation. But that hopefully we can work together as equals in order to best leverage and utilize our capabilities in such a way that we can, uh, again, work toward that most optimal solution. So uh, I, I would just simply say that uh, there are varying degrees to which uh, you could become involved if you just wanted to uh, learn more about the organization and the events that we'll be putting on later. That's one step. If you said, I want to drop every single other club I'm in and I'm all in on this, uh, you know, that's another conversation to have. But, but either way, we'd be more than happy to talk uh, and look at those ways that you could get involved to whatever degree you might want to. I think the short answer is you can give Aaron your email address <laughs> and then come to our next meeting and we can figure it all out together. But that's the idea is that the door is open. We're just in the formative stage. We literally went from an ad hoc working group to the EFI in very short order. And so in some ways our um, the work we've already done out there has outstripped the pillars of the organization here, and it's been an interesting conundrum. Usually it's the other way around for social movements and social change, but um, nonetheless, um, I think the idea would be that the door is open, and so if you're interested, um, you know, we'd be happy to collect uh, net IDs, and we can then be in contact about when the next meetings are and opportunities for participating. We also have an email, environmentalfutures at georgetown.edu. It's live. Welcome to it. Send an email there. And lastly, I have a sheet that I meant to put out at the beginning, but I'm just realizing now I'm going to put out at the end. So I'm going to force everybody to write their names on it, even if you need to give me fake names and ideas. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be. Good. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, hopefully not. Um, is there uh, any other sort of question that we could feel? Well, if not. Does anybody want to pick up any of these? Then talk about them at all? Just briefly, I know we've sort of given you a lot, but. Yeah. Um, I know that you said the event about the migration and uh, displacement is going to be in the fall, but I was wondering if maybe you could like expand a little more on that one. Sure. Um, I, I, it seemed like, do you want to hop in? or? Okay. Sure. Um, I think that uh, this is uh, one of the events. Uh, uh, it's the case that uh, at the EFI, um, as I was saying, we all have uh, various uh, areas of expertise, uh, particular projects that we're passionate about, uh, as is obviously the case. Sophie, who was being very humble and did not give herself credit for writing up that proposal that we brought to the CEC, so one, yes, she did that, uh, is involved with that. Whereas with regard to the speaker series, um, it's the case that myself, Justin, uh, Sarah, who can't be here today, as well as the entire group, um, that we're involved, but but I think that Jess and I could speak fairly well with regard to that. Um, our goal uh, with that event, uh, which we're looking at hosting in mid-November, uh, would be to bring a panel of people, including both uh, individuals who are experts at Georgetown as well as outside of Georgetown, to come to the campus and to speak about the various implications of the interdisciplinary implications of uh, climate displacement and environmental displacement. So. To briefly detail them, I, I know that we mentioned that on October 17th, uh, Anote Tong, the former president of Kiribati, is going to be on Georgetown's campus. Uh, in such a situation where a massive population might be forced to leave its country because of environmental degradation or toxicity, what are the legal rights due to those people? What are the ethical and philosophical issues brought on to the entire global community by virtue of the fact that an entire country has ceased to exist and that everybody has had to flee it? Uh, we're hoping to not provide answers to those questions because they're very difficult questions to answer uh, and the globe doesn't yet have an answer to those questions. Um, but we're hoping to bring that dialogue to Georgetown's campus uh, to really shine a light on an issue that, that we feel is uh, not underlooked per se, but not necessarily as uh, well known in the mainstream environmental sense. Uh, it's important to think about the fact that there are in the United States uh, environmental refugees uh, in Louisiana and Alaska. And so this is not some far off 2075, 2010 uh, kind of issue. This isn't about talking about people in small island developing states or people in the Middle East who are going to be forced to leave several major metropolitan areas because the temperature is simply going to be too hot. This is talking about people in the United States right now, as well as those people globally who are being forced out of their homes and what we have to do to protect them, to do well and justly by them, and to set up systems so that we're not going to be overwhelmed by a refugee crisis 
uh, far greater in scope than the refugee crisis that is currently occurring in Europe. If you think about issues like environmental refugeeism, it, the implications are profound. Um, potential drivers of conflict, mass displacement. I mean, get our minds around the fact of an entire country, a nation, disappearing from the face of the earth due solely to environmental causes, right? Not the, the um, reallocation of land and territory on a map, but literally losing their foothold on this planet. That's a pretty profound and sobering reality check. And let's also couple that with the environmental justice principle that um, oftentimes it's those who contribute least to the problem that suffer the worst effects of that problem. So the implications are staggering when you put it in that context. And these are the kinds of issues that we want to have a front and center dialogue about through President Tom's visit and then the panel on migration and refugeeism as well. Excellent. Oh, and, no, just to add on a real quick bit, these issues aren't just ones we kind of picked and, and chose. Um, Sophie, Mindy, Randall, and I saw President Tong speak at UNAIA in Nairobi. Um, we heard him talk about you know the struggles that his people are going through and all the actions he had to take as president, which actually included buying land and nearby islands in Fiji um, as an investment in case his nation did physically disappear and he had to relocate his people. Um, so these are kind of you know to tie back into the trips. These are things we've heard from people in the environmental, you know, international community that are becoming important issues and that we felt are important to tell um, or to engage students with here in Georgetown with as well. Um, I think that we might have time for maybe one more brief question, uh, if there is one. Um, How on an individual level can each one of us sort of do our part to make sure that we're not further harming the environment, even though we most, most people drive cars on stuff like that? So in true uh, pedagogical Gosh. fashion, I would say, how do you do that? What are the things that you do that are most germane for you in your life as you think about? Because obviously you've thought about that issue. Just give us maybe to start the conversation and the rest of us can populate. Yeah, and I think James can certainly weigh in teaching environmental ethics as well. Well, recently I stopped using straws because I heard about the Go Strawless campaign because straws are very dangerous for the ocean and really can hurt um, the marine life. But. Um, I guess I try, I, well, I do recycle and I try to, I bring reusable bags everywhere, but I'm just wondering what more I can do and sort of if everyone were to do similar things or much more than I currently do, would we be able to make a dent in climate change and environmental factors like that? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to be blunt and say no. <laughs> like, like you as an individual, no, right. there, there isn't, right? Um, uh, if we're talking about you know, this massive global event. Now, that being said, how is it going to change? Well, it's only going to change when literally billions of people around the world change, not just whether or not they use reusable bags, but if we change our, our, our lifestyles and designs. Now, Sophie's been very provocative, uh, I think, in, in her, her discourse and, and, and sort of the area of research uh, that she's interested in, and that is, well, look, if we design this right, then yeah, maybe we don't get to wear 100% polyester clothing anymore because every time you wash that, you get 700,000 microparticles that go out in the environment, right? But that doesn't mean we don't get to wear fashionable clothing, right? Or nice clothing. It means we've got to redesign how we do those. And so, oh, how do you have an impact? Well, one way that you have an impact is through a collective action. If nobody's buying straws anymore, if there's a successful campaign against straws, then all of a sudden we don't have straws. If we vote in such a way that politicians uh, feel like in order to represent their constituencies honestly, they've got to implement policies that ban certain negative activities and provide or facilitate certain kinds of economic development that's green, uh, then that can happen. So, uh, I'm a big proponent of talking about political engagement and, and, and what we can do there. But I also am convinced that in order to live well, you have to do what you're doing right now. And that is really be thinking about it. How do I act as a globally responsible citizen today? And uh, there's not like a stock answer, right? It'd be great if we could have the next slide and it was like, hey, there you go, right? <laughs> These are your 10 plan. plan. <laughs> and, and you will solve uh, the issue. We don't, but it, it's absolutely through creating a, a, a collective and global ethic of yeah, we need to be responsible citizens. So, so let's have this conversation and let's each of us interrogate our lives. And, and that's the best part, is, is you live well. 
Like this is one of the secrets of happiness, right? And, and this is where you're right, positive psychology and all this backs up what I'm saying here. When you are engaged meaningfully in ma making your lifestyle match what you know has a positive impact on others, it is one way to live happy. So I'd like to just maybe amend my colleague's response just a little bit and say, not no. I know what like ah, it is yeah. true that like a single individual's capacity to impact things at the global scale is fairly minimized. And yet the butterfly effect, chaos theory, like small actions do have large implications. Um, I know one thing for sure, that nothing will change if we don't do those things, right? And so there is that, that that the lack of doing those things. And you know, the history of, of social change really does show that it's ground up that makes the change, and then it gets reflected in top-down solidification. So it's the mass mobilization that ultimately leads to the impactful legislation. And there's a synergy between those two things. You know, so if we wait for that, if we wait for some edict or mandate to tell us how to live differently, it's probably gonna be too late. In the meantime, we can all do the kinds of things we need, we know cognitively that we need to do, and bring our cognitive and pragmatic goals in alignment. We all do that. That's a critical mass in the works, and, and I think that that knowledge is beginning to get out there. The issue is are people being straightforwardly given opportunities and feeling empowered that those choices will make a difference, and that I think is partly where policy making and lived experience can meet halfway um, and, and do so in a productive way. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's complicated, and these are profound questions. I'm a big advocate of all of us making changes that we can control and then looking for like-minded individuals to scale up the impact of those behaviors as a way of achieving a kind of tipping point that will and must be registered in the policy and governance circles at the same time. So I'll accept your amendment, <laughs> and, and I'll add, add one it was more. a friendly amendment. Friendly so. amendment. I'll, and I'll add uh, one more amendment as well. Um, policy is important. Policy does, a regulation, I'm a believer, and I'm a, I'm a believer in that actually that, that policy and, reg and, and regulation is a kind of negotiation with the populace, but we can't bootstrap ourselves out of the problem with policy and regulation only because at just logistical capacity, there's too many people in the world and we all have too much agency in terms of how we live our lives, even when you have laws in place. Uh, so right, we can't, we can't completely clean the sewage system if uh, people are still flushing stuff down the toilet and there's no way we're gonna put a monitor on every toilet. Right. Uh, so just as a as a metaphor, we we have to change the norms and culture, and so that is that is very much about our individual actions. Thank you all so very much. I really appreciate you all coming today. Um, please uh, help yourselves to some cookies and lemonade. And um, give us your email address. And give us your leave. email addresses. I'm going to stand up before everybody else does, so I can put that right down. Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, you know, we did this, uh, and we sent people to Nairobi and we sent people to Merida so that we could bring back information and we could bring back uh, experiences and action items for the entire Georgetown community. And so to be able to have people here uh, and to be able to further disseminate beyond this, uh, that really is uh, one of the things that we're most passionate about. So thank you all so very much for coming. And thank you very much to all the people that we were very lucky to send abroad. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate yeah, thank it. you all. Yeah, thanks for letting us share the photos of our family vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had the old slide projector. Remember those? You guys remember old slide projectors with like they had the like the little yeah. rotating carousel? You guys don't remember? No, I'm talking about the other. It was like these little rings, and you put these slides in, and then it would go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. It would spin around, and it would show the photos, and they'd inevitably be upside down and backwards. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and right, that, that wasn't that very